there are a lot of things we won't cover today because this is sort of a three, four part series that we do. So today we are gonna focus on sales. We're not gonna focus on marketing aspects a whole lot. So we're gonna focus more on B2B selling, understanding the mechanics of it and a little bit more in that sense. So how many people here think they are in sales? What about others? When was the last time you sold? Did you convince your spouse or your friend to basically come here, right? Or you convinced yourself you came here, right? You did some selling. So believe it or not, every one of us is in sales. We sell all the time. We learn like to admit it, right? Why? Because the typical model of selling, unfortunately, is this, right? That's not how sales are done. What does the left one remind you of? Or the, the bottom one? Right? That's the image we have been made to believe. Or somebody knocking on the door. Right? But that's not how sales are done in today's world. It used to be, they used to say sales mantra is ABC. Who wants to tell me what ABC is? Not you. Always be closing, right? Unfortunately, that model is broken. It doesn't exist anymore. So we are going to talk about what does sale look like today? And how do we get there? So this is a book that I would recommend if anybody is interested. This is one of the best books I have come across recently. It is not about selling, but it is about general concepts to tell you to sell is human by Daniel Pink. And he quotes some interesting statistics. He says one in nine people in the US actually work in sales in, the, in this country. And there are 15 million people whose job is sales. Not all of us do selling, but 15 million people have the exact role of being sales. How much is the time we all spend in sales? Over 40%. And we all suck at it. So let's figure out how do we make it better? What is it that we do which is not good? What is it that we can do to improve? So one rule of this class is let us make it interactive. Ask questions. If there is a question, if I am talking some words that don't make sense, I won't know until you raise your hand. I may not come back to you right away, but I will come back to you if you raise your hand. So feel free to do that if something isn't working out for you or is not making sense, by all means, let me know. We'll make all these slides available to you. You don't have to worry about them. So I think they'll, including I think the video also will be posted at some point in time. And the video will oh, excellent. And let's give Nihar a big hand because he is the man who gets things done in the back all the time. Okay, so let's do some selling. Um, who wants to sell me something? Tell me. Any volunteer who wants to sell me something? Prasad, you want to sell me something? I want to sell the audience something. Okay. S what would you like to sell them? Uh, I want uh, the audience to enroll in a program called Startup Leadership Program. Okay. Sell them. How many of you here are looking to gather all the skills for uh, being a good entrepreneur. Okay, so I'm here to sell startup leadership program. We take 0% equity. It's a very nominal fee, only $500. And with that, you get six months of program to cover all aspects of being a startup founder, not just hard skills, but also soft skills. We teach you how to do customer discovery, validation. Uh, one of our members, Bhushan, he was, he's also an SLP fellow. You can vouch for that. Uh, in return, you get amazing mentorship. You get very good networking opportunities. And at the end, you also get to pitch to VCs. So who's up to enroll? Not okay. Okay. Uh, who else wants to do some sale? Come on. 
What, what's the phone you have? iPhone. OK, why don't you sell me this iPhone? iPhone? Yeah. What, what iPhone do you have? iPhone 8. OK, sell me an iPhone 8. Why should I buy an iPhone 8? Go ahead. Hey, Paul, this is the new product uh, I'm selling, which is uh, manufactured by one of the world leader, yeah. Apple. Uh, you name it, it has all the features. Mm -hmm. okay. It will help you in your business, uh, in your <coughs> not, not only in a personal communication, but as well as to do your day-to-day -day work as well. OK. Who else wants to sell their iPhone? I can, I can do that. Yeah, go ahead. So, hold on. What phone do you have? I have an iPhone. Okay. Yeah. Which one do you have? I have an old model, 6S. Okay. Yeah, but I'll sell that. All right. Let's see. Okay. okay. So, um, you see how we, uh, in our day-to-day -day lives, when we go around, we look at things, we look at the status quo, right? We look at, at systems, at people, at products, processes that are the way they are, and they continue to be that way, right? So, this is about changing that. This is about you know, challenging the status quo, so to speak. Which means that all these things that you interact with around you are, are built by people just like you. And you have a chance to do something better, right? With your life, with your work, with your career. And I'm here to introduce a device that is gonna extend, that is gonna be an extension of yourself. That's gonna enable you to do that. Would you all be willing to try it out? Something no. that is, I will not. <laughs> Nobody from this audience is going to buy a phone from either of you two. Okay. Okay. Sure. <laughs> no, because we are recording it. Uh, I have iPhone 10, and uh, my neighbor has iPhone 8, and he wants to give it to me for free. Right. So I'm. I don't need that because I already have a phone. I'm ready to sell it for 50% of the market price. Anybody wants to buy? Yeah, everybody knows iPhone. I don't need to sell the because feature. The iPhone prices are very like eight has already gone down to 50%. Oh. <laughs> okay, consider 50% of that. <laughs> He's negotiating. Okay, so let's. So guys, I will not buy a phone from any of you. Oh. Why do you think that is? Exactly. You didn't even try to figure out because he did a best job when he said, how many of you want to do entrepreneurship? Yeah. Nobody said, hey, Paul, do you need a phone? What kind of a phone do you want? What is it that you want your phone to do? No. He just said, Pfft. this is called an engineer's way of selling. We all have it in us because we are all engineers. We like to sell features. We don't like to sell benefits. So think the other side, not your side, if you want to sell. So we'll talk about it more. So let's first understand this funnel. And you will get about 500 variations of this funnel if you Google it. But the basics are the same, OK? Which is that on the top of the funnel, I need to get suspects. Some people call them leads. I call them suspect which means there is some interest. I think they're interested. I don't know whether they're interested or not, but I think they're interested. And I'm gonna go have to qualify them. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes in order to make sure that they are really prospects before I spend and waste more time on them, right? And after that, I'm going to follow up with them so that they are willing to become my customers. Sales process used to stop there. And if you know the, you know, in software business, the only thing we sell is SaaS, right? And in SaaS, there is a new position which has been started in almost all companies called customer success. Why do you think that is? Because selling doesn't stop at making you a customer. The selling stops when the customer crosses that love wall and become your reference. When the customer is willing to talk about you, when the customer is willing to give you another customer to say, these are good guys, do business with them. 
that is when you really achieve selling. Because if you think about it, if you, you know, how do you guys buy even a $5 product? What do we do? Tell me. You want to buy a $5 pen. What are you going to do? You're going to buy it on Amazon. What's the first thing you're likely to do? Reviews. Right. What is that? That is a customer who loved your product. You look at them as well as people who are detractors. And then you make a decision whether you want to buy it or not. So why is B2B any different? No. It's equally the same thing. Right? So this is something you've got to put it in your mind. This is what you have to achieve. And we're going to talk about each of these things, but we're not going to spend time today on how do you get suspects in a large volume with the marketing and reducing it and all that. That's not the purpose of the class. Today we're going to talk about I have a B2B sale. I've just started a company. I need to get my first X number of customers. How do I get them? Then you got to ask more leading questions okay. until such time you get your response. Yeah. And if the customer isn't coming there, then you are wasting your time. That's a part of qualification. Okay. It's a message to you to don't waste your time, walk away. So what is the goal of initial sales, right? As a startup, the first thing we want to do is we want to get a product market fit. Right? Everybody has heard this term, product market fit. You keep hearing it. Does anybody know what a product market fit is? Yeah? Well, uh, at least at the initial lower, lower level scale when a uh, customer wants your product and wants willing to give you one. Okay. Anybody else? Once you have reached a stage where you can kind of like if you have product product market fit, the idea is you can go and focus on the growth then basically expand it to other areas, other geographies, other, mm -hmm. like multiply it basically. So till you have not reached the product market fit, you are still kind of trying to find the sweet spot where you will succeed eventually. Good. Product market fit happens when you have a a market that needs what you have built, or it's a new market. Ideally, it's a new market. It's not an existing market. But the cusp, the you know everything's so magical, so easy, you know because the need is so good and probably are. That will be a nirvana. It doesn't that? happen in real life. What's that? that is I said that's a nirvana. Yeah. It doesn't happen in real life except for once or twice. But in general, you are on the right path, right? So product market fit. When the product market fit happens, yes, your selling process becomes easier. So the goal of our initial sales is, how do I get to that? Because if you don't get to that, no serious investor is going to put money into it. Unless it's a very complex product that you spend a lot of time building, that's a different story. So in that phase, we're trying to test two things. We're trying to test, is my message resonating with my target audience or not? And the second thing, Am I really even targeting the right customer or not? So those are the two tests. If you achieve those, you will get a product market fit. And you also want to understand the selling process. So for example, let's just say you are selling some software. And you know that you have to sell not only to the department manager, but you also have to sell to his boss and you also have to sell to IT, and you also have to sell to f three other people, which means what? That means for every one of them, I'm going to add my sales cycle, which means I better not price this product so low, because otherwise I'll be out of business. If it's a product that I know people just click their credit card and just buy it off of the website without touching anyone, I can afford to sell it for a lower price. So this is another test you are doing in order to figure that out, right? And you want to understand, and obviously you want to get a reference, right? Because without that, all that is waste. Okay, so we're going to come back to this again and again, but I just want to give you a perspective. 
This is a very typical SaaS company funnel. You have a 50,000 visitors that came to your site, which are kind of like suspects. The neophytes call them leads. And then you put some self-qualification wall on the website. And let's say out of that you generated maybe leads worth 10K. That's just being generous, but let's assume that's normal because your message was right. After that, you put some kind of a marketing qualification wall and you get a marketing qualified lead. How do we qualify a lead from a marketing perspective? We check the engagement. If this person came to our website, downloaded something, did something else, did something else, now we know this person is more interested, right? He might be a competitor, but that's what we have to figure it out. So that is kind of going to get reduced to about 2K. After that, you're gonna put a sales qualification wall. You're gonna see if this person is really gonna buy anything from me or not. Maybe you just make a phone call. And then you're gonna generate what we call a sales qualified lead. It's not the SQL as in database world, but it is an SQL in different world. So you might get 400. And then you follow up, follow up, follow up, and you know, 100 of them turn into an opportunity out of which 30 of them actually buy. And then if you're lucky, 15 of them are willing to give you a reference. So this is real. So this is what I want you to understand. To get 15 customers, where did you start with? Right? So when you are a startup and you're building a budget, most people say, ah, I'll spend $500 on SCM and there'll be a magic and I'll get 500 leads and they'll convert. Good luck. Doesn't happen in real life. This is how it happens. This is an actual funnel of a company. Question. Uh, I just wonder a few examples that you can, uh, like you have seen in your past for self-qualification more on the website. Like how can you judge them? So, so self-qualification is generally done by messaging, right? If my messaging is very precise, so let's say I'm selling a very technical product. My focus is developers. And I'm saying X, Y, Z for Java developers, as an example. What am I telling Amrita? Don't stay on my site, I don't want you here. She might have jumped in from 10 other places and came to my website, or maybe I did some stupid ad where I wasted money and I got her to click. But I don't want her to stay because she's gonna waste my time. So I want her to leave. So my message qualified her and told her, don't stay here. Right? So that's one way of qualification. There are many other ways, but just an example. Okay. So let's, let's split the product pricing into two for now. Less than 5K, more than 5K per month, right? In SaaS, we only talk per month, right? Everybody knows what MRR is. Anybody who doesn't know MRR? Monthly reoccurring revenue. If you're ever gonna be in SaaS business, remember this word. Even in your sleep, if somebody just slaps you and wakes you up and says, what is MRR? You should know the answer. <laughs> That's how good you have to get into it. And then what is ARR? Everybody knows what ARR is? And uh, what is CAC? Customer acquisition cost. Customer acquisition cost. And what is LTV? Lifetime value. Lifetime or long-term value, right? And we'll talk about the ratios of LTVs and CACs. Maybe we won't have time for it today because that's more marketing side, but at some point in the marketing class, we'll talk about that. But for today's class, we're gonna focus on selling and trying to get the initial customers. So if you need for less than 5K per month, I need to have five reference customers before somebody will take me seriously. If you wanna raise money, that's what you need. And if you are selling a product for less than 5K per month, 
If you don't have 50 customers, nobody's going to take you seriously. That's called achieving the first level of product market fit. So the question I have for you is, if you need 50K, if you need 50 references, where should you start? Oops. Where should you start? I need 50 customers. How many visitors should I start with? And if I need only five, where should I start? Then you calculate how much does it cost to get there, right? So let's figure out which prospect should I contact, right? How do I message my prospect? What kind of sales pitch do I need? Should I do a POC, should I not? And follow, follow, follow until I can close it. And then continue to follow even after that because I want them to be referenced. So we'll talk about that. So we'll go into each of these. Yeah. Anybody else wants to say? Proof of concept. If you're gonna sell an enterprise product, which is more than 5K for sure, you're gonna need a POC. No customer is gonna buy without that from a startup. Yeah, question? Is the conversion funnel that you put here on the last slide, that's the typical SaaS conversion funnel? I mean, it can vary depending on where you enter in the funnel, but yeah. I, I, I saw this kind of, so this typically happens when the marketing budget is so much, right? And usually you can go with targeted accounts or like account-based marketing or things like that. Startups don't have that kind of marketing budget. Uh -huh. That's why we're going to talk about it, how to do it. Sure. <laughs> See, so you, you have a right idea. So, so let's understand something, right? I don't always want to enter here. I can enter here. I can enter here as well. So I need to figure out how do I enter here as a startup. I don't want to enter there because I don't have the money to do this. So how do I enter there? That's what we are going to talk about. And if not, where we enter, also how do we increase the numbers without spending money? If you all had the budget, we wouldn't have come to this class, right? So, <laughs> all right, so where should I find my suspect? There are three kinds of suspect I put in the bucket. One I call a hot, well-known, some, First degree relationships. We'll talk about that in a minute. Medium, kind of some relationship, and the cold, no relationship. Oops. Come on. So, where are the most hot prospects, guys? Right, right here. If in your address book, well, actually, LinkedIn is not really that hot, so we'll talk about it. So anybody that is in your address book is perhaps your first hot prospect, right? If you don't have that, then you need to figure out how do I reach to the next one. So how do you reach to the next one? Is you have somebody else who has that in their address book introduce you. Now LinkedIn, there are some first degree connections that I kind of know them. I have 5,000 first degree connections. I probably know 50 to 100 of them. <laughs> I keep getting requests from a lot of people to introduce me to my LinkedIn contact and that's the time I look at it and say, oh gosh, this guy, I have never talked to him. <laughs> Sorry, I can't introduce you. There are too many connections. Yeah, but you should, right? That's the business we are all in. In fact, when I teach my class, one of the first exercises everyone in my class has to do is when they start the class, some of my students don't even have LinkedIn. But before they leave the 16 weeks in the class, they have to exceed their LinkedIn by 200. 
otherwise that is a grade minus yes because what's the point you have to learn how to build your network because the good old fashioned way of knocking on the door is gone so that's the first one now second one how many of you here go to meetups and the other ones who didn't raise their hands should find out google meetup.com and you can find a meetup in the area of your interest that is happening around in fact that's also another thing that my students have to do is they have to attend at least two meetups while they're here in silicon valley and i tell them that if you want to get free food every day <laughs> the food will be beer and pizza and you can have it for all 16 weeks you are here except for fridays and the weekends yeah. it's very easy in the bay area so there is no excuse so if you are interested in something to find the like minded people you got to go network somewhere and you want to network with people who are like minded who may have similar things and in bay area we we don't kind of the, the reason bay area works is we don't try to be like this right we open up our ideas and ideas expand so that's what you'd have to do and that's how you build your network so meetups are a great way there are many startups who will tell you that i met my first customer at a trade show and suddenly i'm thinking people are saying but i don't have the budget i know you don't have the budget how easy or difficult is it to get a pass to say dreamforce to go to the exhibit hall right almost zero it's easy doesn't cost anything maybe it cost 25 bucks big deal right but now you're going to walk the halls but before walking the halls do your research who are you going to meet why are you going to meet them where are you going to meet them they're all there you could get lost in all the maze of 100,000 people or you could direct your search and say these are the 500 people or 10 people or 20 people i want to meet and then you get the best value out of it remember you're not looking for quantity yet you're looking for quality so don't try looking for quantity right now quantity will come later right now i'm looking for quality so less is better i know it is counterintuitive startup means i need to have more but no right now you need the other way and conferences are a great way but it costs money however most of the time many conferences as the days get closer the price keeps on reducing and 90% of the time in the bay area they give it for free so you can go there and that's a great place to meet somebody you see a speaker there from a company that you have been trying to meet that's your best chance but how do you present yourself then is something we should talk about but before that um does anybody know what this is right is everybody is there any network that you guys are not on who is not on the yellow one okay i expected the whole room to say that but okay except for amrita uh so i kind of put this in in terms of for b2b versus b2c a little bit obviously linkedin is kind of the guru for b2b the other place for b2b that you may not know as much is this queue How many of you go to Quora regularly? How many of you are contributors? Okay. And how many of you actually read something or just do it for marketing purpose? Okay. So this is, you know, there are a couple of people who made themselves gurus by publishing or over publishing content on the Quora, right? And they are really not even gurus, but people think they are gurus now right so 
the point being yes you can it's self professed guru because you have the content and people are listening and reading your content and if you put sometimes too much even though there i would like to get more quality but it seems like many of these networks people are able to get value by sometimes doing more quantity than rather quality however that is for later not in this stage of the company right now you're looking for quality so i want to find out i am interested in a particular area i want to look for somebody who might also be talking about that area maybe that's a person i want to reach same thing with discussion forums which discussion forums any of you go to anybody want to name some that you go to yeah reddit um not frequent but starting to okay what is which else anything else there's actually uh, uh, i i do i work in say, uh, it's a sales product so there's something called as inside sales professional aaisp i have two such forums that i subscribe to what about others anybody else subscribe to any thing related in your profession i'm suspect to many sales professional related forums right so that is something you guys have to get to Yes, ninety percent of that is junk mail, but that one nugget is worth the time you spend on it. Because one thing you got to understand: when you are a startup with no budget, you don't have money, but you have time, and your time has no value. <laughs> That's the only thing you have. So use it, right? Because that is what you have to be willing to do. if you really want to make a startup go okay um facebook twitter youtube are kind of on the borderline of whether they work for b2b or not if you're selling a low price product generally yes if your product price goes a little bit higher don't waste your time yet there will be a lot of time in your lifetime to go there and don't try building your presence on every network because you can't manage it it is better to be on one or two and do a better job than be everywhere the other one that does really good job is medium which is not in there it's been a good kind of forum um to it's kind of like shouting on top of empire state building and hoping that somebody is listening to you and believe it or not some people are always listening so that is a good part of it um so that's another one to try what what was that yeah, yeah. Yellow, yellow, yellow hmm? what is the yellow one snapchat snapchat, snapchat. <laughs> it's good you don't know <laughs> because you don't need it but your kids know yeah your kids know it and once you say you want to be on snapchat they'll just never accept your invite so don't even try it snapchat value will go down yeah and they made it difficult enough for all the adults that only kids love it okay i have to delete it from your phone if you find it then delete it yeah okay some do's and don'ts of linkedin even though that's not part of that but i think i, I thought we should do it so Does everybody know what email is? Yeah. yeah? Uh, how many emails do you get for free? Free. Like uh, when you have the paid subscription. What's an email? So that's not free, right? Uh, yeah. What's an email? I don't know. Yes. What is an email? Uh, so an email is basically a private message that you can send to a respected contact, like a person. Someone whom you are not connected to. Not connected to. And how do you do that? By paying money. Come on, it's a paying machine. But you can do it through any of the email IDs. Uh, no, any individual that you find on LinkedIn yeah. that you are not connected to. Oh, yeah. Oh, they said LinkedIn email. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah, we're talking do's and don'ts of LinkedIn. Oh, I'm sorry. So I, I had a premium subscription for a month or two, and I didn't seem to find myself using email too much because I used the personalized invite feature, which works like magic, and I, I contact people left and right by looking at their profile and then saying, sending a personalized invite to them. And But why do you need subscription for that then? I don't need subscription for personal email. I'm just saying that But the premium. I had premium, so I had like 15 email credits for one month, and then I stopped. And I've been using personal email. It, it works pretty well. 
Well, there's a limit to personalized invite. You, you should only put, if you are a- 280 characters. Yeah, if you are a good wordsmith, you could do that. But yeah. with email, you can write an essay. Yeah. If you want to. And no, that yeah. is what you should not do. Yeah. Of course, you should not do. I have bad examples of in-mail in my inbox like crazy. And they go into the garbage instantly. Huh. Why? Because, I mean, frankly, the biggest culprit of that are the Indian services companies. <laughs> they don't even know what you do. They just have the same bloody message that they sent it to everybody. We are offering this service, this service, this service. And I actually one day took five of the messages that I had gotten and they were looked like, you know, just like used car salesmen all, all have the same pitch. This was exactly like that. And they had exact same product. They talked exact same language. And may I, sir, do this? It's like, okay, you gave it that you're calling from India, right, instantly. So you don't do that. That just doesn't work. That's a waste of money. That's $4 gone to LinkedIn. So don't do that. And do like what he does. You don't have money. Why do you want to waste it? Once you start building your network, it's easy to send somebody an invite. Don't take the invite that LinkedIn says without adding a comment. If you send somebody an invite with some little comment saying, hey, I met you there, or some context of why you want to connect, he or she is more likely to accept your invite than if you just send an invite. Right? That's what most people end up doing. So everybody knows the first degree versus second degree. So if you can find the, so let's say there is somebody you really want to connect to and he's second degree to you. Now, most of the time you can probably get them to accept your invite if you write a good note. And a lot of times I get requests from other people saying, hey, you know, I see you're connected first degree to it. Can you introduce me to them? And most of the time, I will, but there are many times I don't even know this person. I might have accepted it for whatever reason. Maybe it was five years ago. I have no idea. And so, but if you can get somebody else to introduce you who may be closer to them, the likelihood of you getting what you want will be higher. Right? All of a sudden, instead of starting at the top of the funnel, you're now starting at the middle of the funnel. So that's how you figure out how do I reduce my cost because I enter in the middle of the funnel. I enter at the right point in the funnel. How else can I enter right point at the funnel without anybody's help? It's called research. It doesn't take a lot to figure out on LinkedIn, you are going to sell a big data product, whether this person deals with big data or he's still stuck in you know, small data with SQL. You can figure that out, it's not that hard. So don't send them the invite, don't waste your resources and their resources, right? Because they are also gonna to have to read your message and say no. So rather than entering at the top of the funnel and then getting rejected, start entering at you know, middle of the funnel where you've already qualified them somewhat. And groups, how many of you have groups on LinkedIn? How many of you don't, are, are not a member of any group? Come on, who doesn't want to admit? How many of you are at least members of 50 groups? 50 is the limit. <laughs> I think they've increased it, right? Or it is still 50. But the reason you want to go to the groups is you want to figure out on a particular topic that you are really interested in, who is more vocal? What are they saying? It gives you kind of the wind of that market. Once you've figured that out, then you can, you know, f get your message correctly. And you may be able to find somebody because, you know, if you're part of a group, you're automatically second degree. Someone who was like third degree to you is now second degree. So it makes it easier to get introduced or to even reach out because you cannot reach the third degree without paying money. Okay. So here is the story of touch points. So the difficulty, so if you meet somebody face to face, 
Them saying no is much harder. They have tougher time saying no to you. The easiest way they can say no to you is if when you reach them in social media or discussion forum, they just ignore you. You can't do anything. Email is kind of like that, but it is sort of in the middle. Telephone still works, believe it or not. If you can reach somebody on the phone, provided they don't hang up on you in the first time, it might work. So therefore, it's really important. What's your message? And we'll talk about that. Uh, are you talking about cold calls, or are you talking about having a context first on email and then calling somebody if they don't respond? Well, it depends how you want to approve it, right? Sometimes it is better to send an email and then follow up. Sometimes it's better to call and then tell them with an email that you called and they rejected your call, you know, whichever way it is. So there are no kind of hard and fast rules you have to figure out on a case by case basis. So let's construct a message. And first thing is you got to put yourself in customer's shoes. Remember, people buy the products for various reasons, right? And the first person who is going to try your product may be a junior engineer, right? If you're selling a technical product, maybe that. Sometimes you have to figure out how do I make them a hero? People buy for their own personal reasons, believe it or not, whether they want to feel good about it sometimes. If it's a small purchase, it doesn't matter. Even if it's a big purchase, if they feel good about you, they might buy. Or at least they will take you to the next stage. They may not have the power to buy, but they'll take you to the next stage, which is what you want. You have to figure out where you enter in an organization, right? And a lot of times your message might be about cost savings. The worst message to have is cost savings, by the way. Why is that a worst message to have? Anybody wants to tell me? Somebody could sell cheaper price. Huh? No. So basically says you have no differentiator except for the price. Well, he tried that. He gave his phone for 50% off. None of you bought it, right? <laughs> what else? Well, because you may have already a built-in relationship with the other customer. So sometimes reliability and other stuff work in that favor, where cost is not. That's one of the other ones, yeah. I think it's all about the value. If you don't have a significant delta in the value of what you are already using versus what you're offering, if there's no you know, del significant delta, then you're not motivated to do that just for cost purposes, just to save costs. So let's, let's put yourself, let's say I want to sell to a CIO, right? And this is an actual pitch from a company trying to sell to a CIO. And we are going to do a role playing with what the CIO said to him and what they think. So you go to a CIO and you say, you know what? My product saves you 60%. And you are wondering, why doesn't the CIO buy my product? Uh, sometimes people have uh, uh mentality that uh, with lower cost, the quality of the product also degrades? Not necessarily. Not in the B2B world. So usually there's a switching cost, meaning the people have to be trained with a new tool. Mm -hmm. and whatever 40% that you're offering, you may end up you know, paying double the price just to train, retrain the employees. Yep, and that's another the problem. There's a training cost problem, right? I think the other problem is, you said f you save me 60%. Let's say your product only costs 10K. And I manage a budget of 10 million. Do I care if you save me 100%? I'm going to kick you out of the room. It's not important to me. Right? You are yourself saying, oh, it's important. It's important to you, but not to me. So don't try to sell me the cost value. Unless you are selling, if my budget is 10 million and you're selling me a $5 million product, I'm not gonna care, right? So sell me value. What am I going to get? What benefit am I gonna get? 
if you tell me that I can increase my sale by 10%, I am likely to get a meeting faster than you telling me I'll save you cost by 100%. Because everybody cares about revenue. No matter how big a company, no matter what position they are in, when they say there is new revenue, new benefit, people want to listen. Now, if it's a new technology, new things are happening, you happen to you know, be on the rising tide, you will do well as well, right? Or something that they couldn't do before. You know they're spending a lot of manual work and they're frustrated every day and you automated that stuff, valuable, yes. So get your pitch right. Get your pitch in benefits, not in what I have. Like, no, my phone does this, this, this. Who gives a damn what your phone does, right? What I care about is what is my problem and can you relate it to my problem and give me a benefit? That's what I buy, right? So, so what kind of messages do I need? I need a short elevator pitch. It's easier said than done. It's probably the most difficult thing to do, right? But if you don't get this right, you don't have a product market fit. Now people will tell you it should be as simple as your, uh, you know, your grandmother can understand. No, not really. Grandmother is not my customer, how do I care? <laughs> I want to do it for my customer, right? If my customer understands it, great, right? But don't make it so technical that it, you, even your customer has a problem understanding because you use every buzzword under the sun, right? I mean, I met an entrepreneur and the, we were talking about what does he do? And in two seconds, he gave me all the industry buzzwords, AI, machine learning, blockchain, blah, blah, blah. I said, but what the hell do you do? <laughs> he couldn't explain. But he had every buzzword under the book. That's a pure recipe for disaster. So don't build a message like that. Build a message that appeals to your customer. They are there to solve a problem of some kind or some value you are giving them that they don't have. So sell that value. Don't try to sell cost savings. Don't try to sell product features because that doesn't work. Okay? So you have to develop your elevator message and then your job is even tougher when you have to develop one paragraph. Why? Because every time you send that email, that same paragraph is going to be in almost every email. And it better be very clear and concise. This is one thing most entrepreneurs don't spend any time on, and it's the worst thing they can do. However, it's never perfect. You send something, it doesn't work, change, try, change, try. Right? Because you have only two things you can test it against. Either your message was wrong or the person you were sending was wrong. So you have to weigh both of those and say what is working, right? And then they will tell you at some point, send me the document. You need the equivalent of data sheet slash one page document. Then that's the next thing you have to develop. Again, relate to the problems that they might have that you are solving. And then if you have a very technical product, very missionary sale, you're gonna need a white paper. That might get you an entry into the door. There are many times I get on LinkedIn from people saying, oh, you know, you might wanna know this, here's, here's a document. And even though I may not be interested in it at that point, but if this is an area that is of interest to me, I might just read it. Now, if it is written kind of as a totally salesy document, it goes in the garbage instantly. But if it is not, if it is written as a document that's meant to educate and at the same time sell in a very kind of nice way, it works. So you have to do it the right way. I think you have to build your website and social sites these days that goes without saying, right? Customer is gonna come in and check your website to see if you exist or not. Now you don't need to build a very extensive website from day one. You can have a one page website, doesn't matter. Just enough where, you know, somebody says, okay, yeah, they exist. 
And many times people will go to your LinkedIn page and they will click on the company you have and there's nothing there because you decided not to build your LinkedIn page since it was a little more effort. And sometimes you build your LinkedIn page and that doesn't look anything like your website and then I go, did I reach the same company or something else? So don't do those mistakes. Make them consistent. Don't start on the path of everything looking different. Okay? Yeah. Um, we also, um, I've also seen this and I'm, I'm trying this myself, is to put a profile summary on LinkedIn and that becomes like a landing page. If it's well, if it's well messaged, that way when you connect to somebody, there's a personalized invite and then that person will obviously go through a summary and decide whether I want to talk to this person or not. And that, that's your sales pitch. So, so you're not even doing Yeah, that yet. paragraph still is valid here too. Sorry, yeah. That's what I'm saying. You write once, use everywhere. This is Java, real Java. <laughs> I have a small question on this. So, uh, like when you are starting, let's say, from ground zero, right? So, what do you write first? Do you write the one pager first or do you write the elevator pitch first? So, like, do you go this order or that order? What do you think is harder? I think elevator is harder, but one pager is easier. So, start with the bigger one. So when we do this in my class, and they write a business plan, usually for one section, they write four pages. Okay. And by the time we end the class, for all sections, they have to write one page. So yes, you're absolutely right. Start with a big one, then condense it down. You have to figure out what is important, because it is also possible in an early phase of your life cycle you may be testing two messages. You don't know which one is right. So you may have two different paragraphs depending on who you're reaching out to. Maybe three even, I don't know, right? With rest of the body is same, but yeah. those are different, right? So how to get the first meeting? It's all in the message, right? And I can tell you, subject is everything in an email. Why? If I don't open it, who cares what you wrote in it? Yeah. So what kind of subject line should I use? If you use a subject line like save X percent, Y percent, do you think I'll even get it? Forget about me reading it. <laughs> Spam. Yeah. Spam. Spam. Spam filters will detect it and say, done, out. I never see it. In fact, I forget the name of the website. You can test your email against spam words. MailChimp does that too? Yeah. But there is this, even a tool if you're not even part of MailChimp. You can run the list. You can run your subject titles. It will say, OK, these are spammy words. These are going to be blocked. So don't do that. Special offer, definitely no. The messages that do work is more of intrigue or somewhere you're seeking an advice from somebody. So it's like, you know, I want your feedback on it. Would you be interested in telling me this, right? So you have to figure out what is that message that works. And you got to test whether once you send the message, what happened? You know, because there is no point in doing that unless you can test it, right? The next thing on, so email has three parts, right? First is the subject line, then is the body, and then is the CTA. What's a CTA? Everybody knows that? Call, Call to action. Now, 90% of you send an email at work every day, and I can assure you, your emails are not read by anybody, except for one who comes and complains to you. Right, because you didn't like what you wrote in there. But most of the emails you write at work, you also don't put any action. You don't, I mean, I read those emails at work, right? And an email will come in and I've read two pages and I don't know what am I supposed to do? Why did I get it? So if you don't have an action for me, why the hell did you send it to me? So the same thing is true of an email that you are sending to somebody else. So it has to have a call to action. And the body is where you are going to provide 
very short and succinct content. Now your product might have 500 features. Don't tell me about them. I'm only interested in two or three. In fact, only one is what you should focus on. Whichever one it is, right, for the persona you're going after. If that clicks, then you have the right winner, right? Don't do the classical mistake of engineers. Whenever something doesn't work, I'll add more features. No. In fact, you should be taking out more features. So same thing in your message. Focus on one message at a time. All right. Now you want to develop your sales pitch. What's the first thing in a sales pitch that should be there? It's called a hook. Some story, something that clicks, that gets you. Maybe emotionally attaches to the other person, maybe talks about their problem, maybe relates in a personal experience, something. And then the problem. And how big is that problem? They may know this problem exists, but they don't know the magnitude of the problem. Right? There are every, everybody who's selling a security product uses that all the time. And it works. Security industry is big, right? And your solution, including demo if needed. And then what are the use cases for your product? A lot of time people go in with like really fluffy stuff and they are not able to tell the customer how they can use their product. Sometimes your customer is really smart and want to help you and you know, a good friend who might give you some ideas, but most of the time it's your job to do that. So build those use cases, kind of, you know, that gets the customer thinking, how can I use your product? Is it, what, what is the scenario? Are you meeting somebody at a conference? Are you calling? Or are you... Any number of them, okay. right? Sometimes your pitch is 30 seconds, sometimes it's 45 seconds, sometimes a minute, and sometimes if you got enough interest by that time, you can go on for hours. But the general rule of thumb is, if you can't communicate me, to me your message within 30 seconds to a minute, I'm done. If you didn't get my interest, right? So that's why sometimes one sentence is good, right? I mean, what is one message Google gives you when you go to a Google website? Let me ask you that. No, no, but what is the message? What does Google say when you go to the website? What does it, what does it provide you? Search. What does that mean? It tells you, you can try my product, searches for everyone, and just go test it. Right, they give you all three just by that simple message. That's how good should your message be. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you're not Google, and Google didn't get there you know, in two days. But that's the point. That's where you have to strive for. How can I create a message which is so simple without me saying anything, people get it? Sometimes the best of the companies have this problem. Apple, we consider the genius of marketing. Look at what they say for iPad. Just check on your phone while they're Anybody has a phone that's working, battery? So what did you get? iPad, like a computer, unlike any computer. What the hell does that mean to me? <laughs> does it mean anything? Learn more, buy. I guess we gotta learn more. No, I wouldn't learn more. I would just go, <laughs> right? It's just that Apple has such a brand, we already know that product that we can relate to, but if it was not a known product, and it had that message, I would just leave. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? So messaging is so hard that succinct message is very, very hard. We don't have time for it, but it, in the marketing class, we actually do it, compare the messages of various companies and figure out what message should it be and how to develop that. All right, can we put the presentation back? Or you got the sales pitches? Come on, this is a video, so if you have this much problem, then we won't have bandwidth. Okay, so you will have this link. You can watch these videos in your own time.
Okay. Can you give us a gist of those videos? So basically, it's it's essentially these are the pitches for the product. So how quickly and clearly can you say what this product is, who is it meant for, and what does it do? Right. I mean, that's really the gist of these, and how quickly you can come to that point, basically saying like I'm um, you know helping so and so do such and such thing, and we are better because. Also, the problem statement. As well. Yeah. I mean, they're all contained within that 20 to 30 second clip. And what they did is they went to a trade show and they talked to the salespeople to say, what does your product do? So that's why it is even more impressive because not only did the company have the message, it actually were able to get everybody to sing the same song, which is really important. Okay. So let's talk about crossing the follow-up wall. So we talked about getting the message, walking them through the funnel. Now let's say they become a prospect. Now they expressed an interest doesn't mean they're going to buy it. Right? It's your job to make the buying to happen. So how many times do you think it takes before you get a response from somebody you sort of know? How many touch points are needed before you get a response from somebody? Seven to nine. It's 11 now. Used to be seven to nine. Is from a warm market? Look warm. Okay. Even, with a warm, even with a warm one sometimes. Because it may be a priority to you, but it's not to them, right? They're doing 10 other things that are higher priority. So they can just sit on it, right? You sent a message on LinkedIn, nah, I don't have time. It happens a lot of times, right? You happen to meet somebody at, at an event and then this, oh, I know you sent me the LinkedIn message. They ignored, ignored. Not that they didn't know. It's just that you were lower in the priority, right? My inbox is full. And I read my email and I mark that email saying I'm going to reply to that. But by that time, I got 10 other messages. You jumped on the second screen. I didn't intend to forget you, but it just happened. And you didn't bother to remind me. You needed something, I didn't. So it's your job to remind me. Don't expect me to take an extra effort to find you. So you remind me again. And I kind of look at it, say, yeah, 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 I need to respond to them. Same thing happens. It might happen three times, four times. Now you figure out a different way to touch them. Maybe LinkedIn, maybe Facebook, maybe whatever means on social, you're touching them. Now, if it is even more important and you have their phone number in your phone book, pick up the phone. They ignore you then, you know where they're going to be, you go reach there. Why? Because you need that. That's the rule of sales. The person who needs it, even though they might need your product as bad, but they don't know yet. So what was the last thing you said? You said you go there. Meaning I know I'm going to be at this event. Oh, okay. I'm going to go find them. <laughs> right? I'm going to go specifically to that event because I know that person is going to be there. Because I know them well. But they're just ignoring me. Because I'm not their priority right now. Now when they meet me face to face, it's very hard to ignore. So remember that chart I showed you. That's how it is in real life. So in general, you expect to touch people about 11 times before you get a response. Don't take it personally. Many times people you know, don't do it just because it's not like they don't want to respond to you or something. It's just that they have too many other things which are higher priority than you are. Even sometimes people who you know really well, they may do it. It hurts sometimes when you, people do that to you, but many times it's not intentional. Right? So the other thing is you have to understand if you're going to sell a B2B product, you've got to understand the sales process. Even the $5 per month product, you have to understand the sales process. Does this company allow you to click a credit card? Maybe not. Right? Some 
companies will not let you. Some companies will not even let a you know, user just buy a SaaS service off the web. What was the biggest strategy Dropbox used, right? When Dropbox came into the picture, they would look at how many people at this company already have my product. Then they will go to the IT manager or the CIO and say, look, I got 50 people from your company already using the product and you have no control on what they're doing. You want to buy that control? I'll give it to you. Now, why don't you become my customer? It worked, right? I mean, they're a huge company. Last, last time I attended one of your presentations, you mentioned the strategic difference between Dropbox and Box and how Dropbox is consumer-centric. Was. Was. They changed. Yeah. And then how Box is very really enterprise-centric and how they, the messaging reflects that. And that was, yeah. yeah. I haven't followed. followed They've the changed. Dropbox. Even though the Dropbox messaging hasn't changed still a whole lot, sure. but you look at the products they are now coming out with and all the focus they have, they now have a huge sales force, which they didn't used to believe in. They do have a lot of people in sales, so they changed, because that's where the money is. So even Slack is using a similar approach, so it knows that individuals in a big company are using it, and then they're using that as an influencer channel. Yeah, because that's a good way that it works, right? It's a proven method that has worked for a lot of people. So there are many times people give a product free even in an enterprise because they want to cause those renegades in companies to start using their product. A lot of the HR products are coming like that into the market, right? Because HR technology has been so backward in the industry that, you know, People see something that they can do reviews easily or something else and they start using it and pretty soon I got 15 users, 20 users in a department using it. Now the you know, manager is willing to pay the money for it, right? So you have to understand how the sales process works for your product. And there's no one simple formula for every product. Even though in general, if the product is priced at a certain amount, Higher than a certain amount, there is going to be a decision matrix that the company has to go through versus a lower priced one. Sometimes up to 500 a month, a director level person can authorize. In some companies, 5,000 a month is okay. So it varies. In some companies, you can't do anything. If it's a, wherever slash month is written, you cannot do it, right? Now POC. It's a question that I get asked, should we do a POC or should we not? And everybody now knows what POC is, right? Why do I need it? Why do you think a company needs a POC? To make sure that trust or belief in the product. Right, trust or belief in the product. Now, you know, if you are selling a product for $10 a month, am I gonna do a POC? Maybe not. But if I'm going to sell at $10 a month, but I got 1,000 users, I might do it, yeah. right? Even though for that product, I would rather find 10 users and give it to them for free for a month and make sure that it works, right? So POC is important. But you know what? A lot of times, startups are very anxious. Customer says, okay, I'm willing to do a POC. And they just start and go there and you know, load their product and say, I got a POC for Citibank. What's wrong with that picture? Should you be pricing your POC at least at cost? Let's not talk about pricing for a minute. Citibank has to wait to do a POC for, right? You do POC for division department office. Yeah, well, let's say you're getting the department guy to say it. Then you're feeling really good. What's wrong with it? You're customizing a product for that company. No, you have not reached that point yet. They may have like hundreds of POCs running at the same time. Yeah. And you never know it goes beyond POC. If you don't have a criteria of success established before you start a POC, you're going to fail. Because you are just an experiment for someone <laughs> who is trying to make feel good about himself. 
This is why sometimes I force an NDA to be done. I want to put NDA's non-disclosure agreement. And a lot of times we would also want to get some document which says this is the success criteria for a POC and what is likely to happen after the POC if you actually need meet the success criteria. One of the most common thing I hear from startups is I've been doing this POC for six months and nothing is happening. Guess what? You never put a light limit on there, right? You never said the POC will run for three months. And if, by the way, you're going to spend that much money, do what Prasad said. Ask for a, some money for POC. Pay, yeah, pay for my cost. I'm going to put professional services cost. You may not get it, but at least you've given them a value that you're going to give it for free. So my point is, do a POC, but before you do a POC, make sure you get all these things done right. Otherwise, you're just, you know, pissing off more resources. You don't have resources, and somebody tells you, hey, I'm willing to do a POC, may not go anywhere. Right? And doing a POC in a lab, God help you. <laughs> because... I mean, no offense, but people who are in the lab, their job is to tire kicking. So unless or until there is an end date or a reason, you're just a guinea pig. So find some champion who says, hey, this is what it is going to take before my product is going to get acceptable, i.e. there is a manager or somebody. So at least that person knows you are going to do a POC. Right? Somebody had a question, yeah. So in, in certain industries, like I work in, in language, uh, NLP and natural language processing, the, the value of even doing a POC is so high because you get, to, you get exposure to the data behind the enterprise firewall, which is very precious. Mm -hmm. The moment you get that, you can do many things with that kind of data. Right. But uh, that, that said, unless there is a, like you said, you know, un unless we ask for something, unless there's some stringent conditions, you don't even genuinely know if they, they see value in that, or are they just experimenting. It's only when you put those criteria out there, that's when you find the real proof, right? Whether they really see the value, whether they really want to make their investment. Well, that's, to me, that's customization. That's not a product, right? That's where you're going to do a lot of customization. Now the challenge is, can you get an NRE from them? I don't know. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Right? If this is your first customer, maybe not. If this is my sixth customer, I better ask for it. So it depends what cycle you are in, right? I mean, in some ways, startups situation is beggars can be choosers, right? So there are things you make some compromises, but don't do it with your eyes closed. Do it with your eyes open, that intentionally you make a certain decision and you know the consequence of it, but you are going to control it by some other way, right? But don't do it just because you don't know it or you didn't bother to do these, this additional work because you were too lazy or you were too anxious. Most of the time it's you were too anxious, right? And uh, customers will ask you, okay, um, can you create a quote for me? Now you don't know what the product price should be. How do you decide? You can look at your competitors for sure. Let's say there's no competitor of mine in the sense that I'm doing a new way of doing something. Then we're in Nirvana, right? <laughs> no, no, it's just a new way of doing it. They have an alternate way of doing it. What's the price of the substitute? Hmm? What's the price of the substitute? Maybe that's another one, yeah. So yeah, pain point, you know, how much you are addressing the pain point. So you can, you know, that's one. And the other thing is the marginal cost, you know. How much you are spending on that, your cost versus, you know, I always price for value. I never price for cost. Okay. I have to determine what is the value to them of my product. I'm only selling value. If I can determine the value, 
if by using my product they will not need two engineers, I know the value of my product. $150,000 times two. I keep 50%, I give you 50%, let's do a deal. <laughs> Hundred and two hundred, I wouldn't worry about it. But hundred and a million, I would worry about it. Why? Because it is telling me you are focusing on the wrong guy with the hundred k. Walk away from there. Focus on the million dollar guy, which means you find other million dollar guys. That's one option. The other is you are not ready to deal with a million dollar guy yet. Walk away from that. Instead, find two other hundred k guys. Let me explain that. Um, let me give you a story. Um, I was doing a startup and um, we were building a voice over IP switch for the operators. So by definition, we were selling to big guys. So we had a choice. Should I sell to the big guys or should I sell to the medium size, small size carriers? And Sometimes you have a choice, sometimes it gets, the design gets made for you. So one of our competitors decided they were going to focus on Sprint. And they became victim of their lab. And they had a POC, paid POC, half a million dollars, right? Feeling great. In the meantime, we were focusing on guys who were giving me 200K, 250K, and I had five customers. Came 9-11. After 9-11, nobody wanted to fund Diddly Squat, right? And be prepared, it will happen, right? That thing is gonna to come to Valley again. It's a cycle. We don't know when the bubble is going to burst. Correction may be 20%, maybe 40%. We don't know, right? But 20% is normal. That's going to happen. That's just economics, physics. You know, anything that goes up has to come down, right? So now what happens? They went to, they tried to raise money and they didn't get any money because they were stuck in the lab with one customer. And they had 40 people in the lab trying to cater to every nuances of Sprint. Oh, this shit is not little well. This thing, you know, is four nines. It's not five nines. Okay, get me five more engineers to correct that. Right? And by that time, they have no money left. Fortunately for us, we also ran out of money, but our investor said, you know what? You guys have five customers. That is rare amongst all of my other accounts who are also losing money. So who do I fund? The one that has this. So we had a life. So you can always do a big mistake sometimes as a startup by being so happy about the big guy being your customer that you can be chewed completely. Why? Because, you know, here is a, here is a good example, right? I went to a meeting with a large company that shall name, won't name it. There were 47 people in that meeting from that company, and I was only guy in my company who was there. So do you think they'll buy from me? No. Because I can't deal with 47 people coming and demanding 47 things from me because I don't have the resources. So you got to understand your limitation. Don't try to be like this when you, when you are not, right? Yeah, if you've raised $10 million, you can do that. But before raising your $10 million, don't do that mistake. So deal with someone you can really focus on and win. Because at the end of the day, your success is what is going to get you the next round, or your company is going to be even in business. Just traction saying, you know, big companies are interested in my product, so BS. How many did you sign up? Who is willing to put the check down 
for buying your product. That's what is the test. So that's what you're going to be measured on. You're not going to be measured on the rest of the stuff that makes you feel good. You know, a lot of time people will come in and say, oh, so-and-so magazine gave me the best award of such and such. So bullshit. I can buy those. <laughs> it doesn't matter. There's no value. So as a startup, focus your resources on what is important. Don't focus on your ego. You got to close the business. That's what matters. Right? And one thing you should always do, never quote a low price to a customer. Let's say you've decided your product you want to sell to this customer for 10 grand. Don't quote a price of 10K. Why not? Anybody? No, no, you've already negotiated the price. You know they're going to pay 10K. But I'm making a quote. What should the quote say? 20K. Always start with a higher price. You can give them an early customer discount. Because someday you want to charge that 100K from the next customer, you won't be able to charge. First customer gets a free ride, that's okay. But make them know you're getting a free ride. My product is priced at 100K. I'm just giving you for 10K because you are the first sucker. And oh, by the way, in return for that, I want something from you. Reference. Reference. Because that's worth 90K to me at that point. Because it's, I'm not going to be measured on revenue as much as I'm going to be measured on how many good customers I have, right? No, first year only. Oh. Next year I may not need you, right? <laughs> Next year we will talk at an equal term right. if I am in business, right? Maybe. Okay. But if the customer is smart, they'll say, okay, let's do a three-year deal. Three. Unfortunately, most customers will not want to do a deal for three years with a startup. Yeah. So it works in your favor in that case. Right? Yeah. So don't agree that you only do a one-year deal, and I'll give you the same price for five years. Don't do that mistake. That's the worst. If they say, I want to do a five-year deal, sure. Let's make a five-year deal, but now you pay me up front. That's what a five-year deal means. Because you need cash. You will take it. Even at a discount. Right? Now, has any one of you ever negotiated a contract with a large company? I know your hair tells me that. Because <laughs> that's what it does to you. So you've got to learn how to do that right. And many a times what happens is startups go to a lawyer. And you know what? You know what a, how does a lawyer get paid? No, time. Lawyer doesn't get paid by value, that's the problem. <laughs> In fact, I'll tell you a story. So I joined a startup, and the first time I, you know, got in that seat, all the bills were thrown my way. And there was a bill for $75,000 from my lawyer. $75,000? What the hell? What did you guys do? Um, I don't know, you know. The sales guy said, I don't know. Okay, so I went to my lawyer. I said, dude, why is this $75,000? I'm not paying you a dime out of it. Oh, it's not my mistake. Your sales guy sat in our office and negotiated every contract with us sitting there. So we spent these many hours, here is a proof. I mean, I didn't pay him that money in the end, but that's a different story. So I said, it is your mistake too. You are smarter than my sales guy. You should have figured it out that, you know, that's wrong thing. You should have told him not to come here for every little thing. So the point of this I'm telling you is focus on things that matter. 
So I go to my lawyer and say, okay, out of this clause, tell me the three things I should worry about. Or here are the three clauses I don't understand because they are not in English. Can you tell me what should I do? Now you have contained your problem. Otherwise, it will never end. And you know certain companies are not going to accept certain things from you anyway. A smart lawyer will tell you, but most lawyers will not tell you. Because they are not in that business to tell you, right? They get paid by time. So you are, at, you are there, so why not? So that is something you have to know, right? And for all the engineers, Dilbert said it right. That if you want to get, earn the love of your customer, you first have to get your product right. You have to build the love in your product. Many a times, you know, as Dilbert says here, if everyone exposed to a product likes it, the product will not succeed. Why? Because nobody loves it. So you have to build the love in your product. How to do that? Not part of this class, but something to think about. So, can you buy love? Yes, you can. Right? Startups, first product always suck. If it doesn't, that means you're not a good startup. You kept the product too long in your own closet. That is the wrong thing to do. But how do you buy love? By giving a red carpet welcome to your customer, recognizing the problem, sometimes going out of the way to fix the things. And sometimes they may not be even your problem. But you want to get that reference from your first few customers. And it is really important. Right? Now, many a times what happens is the support is thrown to some junior guy who doesn't even know what the hell the product does. And the senior guy is building next features. Guess what? If the last feature doesn't work very well, why the hell are you building the next one? So throw it back to the developer. Get them involved in this process early on. In the startup, that is very crucial. Later on, when you become a big company, you can have a process. You don't need it right now. Let your engineer also be a support person. Why not? So they understand what problem they're causing. How are the customers using the product? Get them involved. If you are a founder, you should be doing that too. Now you know they love it. So what do you do with it? Well, first of all, this is another cartoon which I think says some interesting things, which is the percentage of customers who will buy from us without any effort whatsoever on our part is 0%. And sales, by the way, is kind of climbing the stairs. There's no elevator. So start early. So when should you start selling your product if you're a startup? Before building the product. Before building the product. Otherwise, don't build it. If there's no demand, what the hell are you building it for? Don't build it for your ego. If you're building it for your ego, don't find customers. Put it in an open source. Feel good about it. And if you get lucky, a lot of people use it, you will create a company. That's another way. People have done it successfully. You can do that too. But then don't try a different route, right? So now, we are coming to the end. Maybe not a fully baked product, but something has to be there, right? So there has to be some initial investment before we are. Of course. Just making noise, right? No, but here is the thing, right? So the way, if let's say I want to decide to build a product, right? I want to do some market research to figure out what is the type of customer who is likely to buy it from me. I mean, I can create a, a prototype that looks like it is a real product if I need to, so that I can 
give you the visualization. If you can't do that, you shouldn't build the product, right? So I can do that and kind of get the reactions. Now, if I have done that, I will build the right product. Right, but, but, but sometimes you, you want to also give a time frame, right? That by this time, it will be fully baked. Of course. You, like you don't want to go into a big company and say, okay, yeah, well, this is great. No, no, they're going to ask for your release, release schedule and all these things, right. right? Generally, most startups don't succeed in selling to big companies right away, right? Unless you are very specifically designed around that. Right? I mean, I'm working with a startup which is actually designed around that problem. So yes, but if you have kind of not designed around that, then you don't start there. Even the biggest of the companies were not formed like that, right? Salesforce is a classical example. It used to sell to SMBs. Today, SMBs are not even their customers. Uh, so that's kind of what you have to do. I think in case of NLP AI, Accuracy is, is what is important. So they need to see something. We cannot just fake like a you know, MVP where sometimes you just have fake things. But in case of deep learning, they want to really interact with it to see if it is real or not. So to achieve that, in some cases, you would have to build something. You have to have some basic technology working to reach that stage. So I have seen a lot of people do a different way around the deep learning and other things, right? I know that the customer has a problem that I'm trying to solve. And I believe most of the deep learning where you need a customer data is really not a product, it's a service. So why don't I sell them as a service initially, whereby I retain the IP? Now I have built a product. Don't have to go the tr traditional way, right? So you have to build that credibility to well, if, if you have the credibility as a technical person, you can get an engineering contract from them to solve that problem, if they have that problem. So long as you made a deal with them that you will retain the IP after it is done. That's another way to do it. A lot of companies have done it successfully. What about hardware products, devices? What about hardware products? What, what can I tell you about that? Building before selling on that concept. Hardware, hardware, hardware products are sold before they are built always. It's called Kickstarter. So I can give a very good example of hardware product that costs fifty thousand dollars, let's say. So, so but you gotta have a reputation in that industry. So we sold a lot of stuff to Honeywell strictly on a three D model. But it looks very real, I and mean, in graphics we could open it, we told them what modules would be there, what each module spec would be, and what the total product cost would be. Well, then the question comes, well, who are you? How can you do it? So those things work if you have some reputation in that industry. We had done products uh, in similar markets, but they were very different. And the whole idea of this product was that military was trying to shrink the footprint of a product, which was very important because you had to transport all this equipment overseas. So size was a big deal. And we were coming up with a different concept of doing the same thing, but different architecture to lower the, the size, but increasing the cost. And they were happy to pay us you know, multi-million dollar NRA. And we own all the IP, but we gave them a custom configuration for their test system. But the core IP we could transport to other applications as well. So we've done that a few times. It works, but you need to be in the industry. You need to have a reputation. You need to have a history of products that Correct. you've done Correct. before. If, if you don't have that. If you don't have that, it's very then difficult it's, to go then to it's difficult, right? make something. Have then a that will work. Have a co-founder who does, yeah? yeah? Absolutely right. Or work with a company. You can partner with a lot of companies. You could go to a company that has yeah, that. They are design partner. And you customers. could work with them, saying, "Hey, I have an idea with your, you know, manufacturing and you know your uh, history. Yeah, exactly. We can do something that's a step beyond what you're doing today." And that works very well too. So let me ask, whose job is it to do selling in the uh, in the initial five sales? Founders. 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 Why not hire a sales guy? <laughs> have the same passion. They don't even know what the hell you want to sell yet. Because you don't know yourself, right? 
you're trying to figure out. But, but most of the engineers say, but I don't know how to sell. So what do you do? Learn it. Learn it, and what else can you do? Just jump. jump. Be ready to fail. Find a co-founder who co can help you do that, who will also develop the same passion as you do, and then you can make it happen. There is no point in having 100% equity of zero, <laughs> right? It's okay to share. The most successful companies are the ones that make other people rich, not just themselves rich. Then people want to work with you again and again. So it's okay to distribute. Because in the end, everyone brings that value to you to make you more valuable. But you have to find the right person because a wrong person can hurt you more than help you. And that's a tough one. And not the topic of this class, but another day we can talk about that. Okay, so now that we are at the end of it, let's redefine the ABC to be from always be selling to the new concept that Daniel Pink said, A is for attunement, B, B, B is for buoyancy, and C is for clarity. So what does that mean? Well, you'll remember it now. So the first thing is, remember, we are now in an age where, you know, let's just take a very simple example, right? You used to go to a, buying a car and you had no clue about what the price is, how the price is. You will go to a salesperson, he'll make the trip back, back room saying, okay, let me talk to my manager. It just so happens manager doesn't exist there. <laughs> and he'll come back and he'll offer you some price. Then you will go again and he'll say, let me go to my finance guy who also doesn't exist there yet, right? So he's done three, four, five negotiation, but you don't know any better. Today, what do you do? You go to that person and you say, ah, I know the invoice price is this, and oh, by the way, I know more about your product than you, Mr. Sales Guy, know about this car. Now, how the heck do I sell? My buyer has power too. Because he has the information or she has the information on their fingertips as much as I do. In fact, more. So the power balance has shifted. And that is what is the key in terms of why this has happened, right? Why the old ABC doesn't work. So you have to put yourself in the buyer's shoes. You have to know what the buyer already knows. And in that context, you have to say, okay, what problem am I solving for him? And that becomes really important. Now, you guys are all engineers here, right? You read the Archimedes principle. So what is, what is the buoyancy? Stay afloat. Stay afloat, right? You take something, it comes up. Guess what? It's a problem of sales. It takes about nine to 10 times being rejected, but you still have to lift up and go for the next sale like nothing ever happened. And if you can't do that, don't be an entrepreneur because you're gonna fail. Because entrepreneurship journey, as sexy as it looks in the valley, is a pretty shitty journey. It's a journey of being alone all the time. And there are more lows than highs. So when you get a high, celebrate the damn thing. Have a nice wine or champagne or whichever way you celebrate and enjoy it because there will not be many highs. So that is why it is really important for you to understand that. And so this is very important. If you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to be in sales, learn to be buoyant. You're going to get rejection, don't let it get to you. Sometimes some of your best friends will say no to you. And you will take it personally and your friendships will be affected. Don't, it's business. Separate the personal and business. Right? And clarity. Clarity of message, clarity of the problem you're gonna solve for me, and short and succinct. 
So one of the exercise I want all of you to do later on is I ask you to introduce yourself. Now reflect back and see how you introduce yourself. Think of yourself as a product. Come up with a pitch that describes you. This is my famous interview question from everybody. I ask them, okay, describe me. How would you describe yourself? So if you can't answer that in 30 seconds in a very, very sharp way, you're not gonna get the next interview call. At least not from me. So make sure you get that right. It's important, you're a product, just like everybody else. So now I know my ABC. <laughs> Questions? I wanted to play the Barney song, but I couldn't get the recording. <laughs> Any other questions? Can you introduce yourself again? <laughs> <laughs> Not now, you're doing it. Now you're doing a trap for me, right? <laughs> now I'm not gonna get into that trap. What else? The POCs, let's say things are not going well. Mm -hmm. Is it a good idea to stop in between and go on? Yes. It's called throwing good money after bad. It's better to cut your losses at some point and move on. But you have to make that decision. Nobody else can, right? So yeah, you covered B2B pretty well. So you know, what's the difference you know, from the B2B to B2C? You know? So B2C is B2B, right? So sir, you know, I know B2B is more depth. You know, we need the industry knowledge and B2C is more, you know, bit, you know, pretty much. So. Well, so B2C sales are not done the same way as a B2B sales, right? Mm -hmm. And I categorize B2B products that are lower priced in the same category as B2C. So the way my customer acquisition is going to be is very different. I'm going to create a message and see if it flies or not. Where does it fly? Where does it not fly? I would create maybe a SEM campaign and check it out. I'll create a Facebook campaign and check it out. I'll spend $50 and find out if this message even works. I'll go to my AdWords uh, you know, screen and figure out what keywords people are searching for. Can I even get the right keyword to direct people or not? So I would do a very different testing of the message. I'll give a free download. Sure, no problem. Maybe 30 day download. Maybe even 45 days, maybe even free for the earlier customers. Because I may be interested in building the volume first, right? So it depends. Because most of the B2C and B2B low cost products, they may have to, you know, most of the time when you ask them your, their KPIs, they'll say I have 200,000 users. But then you have to ask, how many pay? And then suddenly the number becomes 10,000, right? But that's how that business is done. So you first go for getting those people and then you figure out who is using my product more and then you try to put a paywall and get them to pay. So it's a very different mindset. It's a more marketing mindset than a sales mindset. Here you are kind of, you are in control a little bit better about what to do. So my question was, what else can we do in terms of better targeting, like getting between the funnel, apart from LinkedIn and all these things that we mentioned? Uh, Trying to know who that customer is, right? And what is their pain point? If you already know or have a better insight into that customer or in that problem. Right. So for example, right? I know that in this year's budget, the company has decided to spend a million dollar on data science project and I'm working on the data science project. And I know it is budgeted. Now I am gonna enter at the right place in the funnel. I if I, the that's called sales, right? I'm gonna figure out from the contacts that I build and the relationships I build and somebody will tell me. Or this is a qualifying question I'll ask. Do you have a budget for it? Yes, we do. 
Okay, great. Okay. What else? What about using the third party marketing agencies, uh, uh, buying a list uh, of customers? How effective is that in, in, in current uh, situation? I know it was great, and that was the only way a few years ago. So, it depends. If we are talking about early sales, no. Once you have the first five customers, as a growth, it can work, provided done right. There are many wrong ways to do it and some right ways to do it. We'll talk about growth at some point else, but yes, it is possible. So my question was for B2B uh, targeted selling, is, is testing the waters with LinkedIn ads initially not spending too much money, is that, is that a good idea? Or you just end up with people that just like, like there's only likes and then they're not really- No loves. No loves, right? And, and my experience with LinkedIn ads is horrible. I, I don't know, this is my personal experience. It's been a waste of money. Uh, SEM works better. Google works better than LinkedIn anytime. And, and, and another thing is a lot of companies spend time on creating content out there, especially B2B, right? Like they create you have content. to. Content is the king in B2B. Right. That's okay, that's for, but that requires time as well, right? Yeah. Compared to targeted wow. messaging. Again, what you have is time. <laughs> <laughs> No, you don't have the money. I'm talking about, you know, like going to conferences, talking, giving webinars and things like that. Okay. But let's go back. Okay. Conferences and talking, right. unless you are an industry expert, it's a pay to play. There is no free. Every conference is pay to play. Yeah. So you have money, then you can do all those things. But if you don't have the money, you're going to hang out in the hallways and look for the people you can talk to. Now, you initially got your customers, but you're selling the product for fifty dollars. Yeah. But now you're trying to increase the price to one fifty. I mean, naturally, you have better team, better equipment, and all that kind of stuff. So, how do you convince um, even your customers they were getting a fifty dollar product to now start paying you one fifty, and also to start attracting that hundred fifty dollar market? Uh, so that's a great question. It's very difficult to raise prices, usually with your existing customer, right? But, you know, people change their style. They go from, you know, they do a makeover and suddenly they look different. So you have to do a makeover of the company, right? If you had a shitty website because it could do it and everything worked fine, now you are upgrading yourself. You got to upgrade your image. Right? You got to upgrade how you deal with it, how you show yourself. All of that is the first starting point of telling somebody that, hey, now I am different. Right? So that's kind of the first starting point. After that, it is how good a negotiator you are. So I have a question you know, regarding her question. You know, so I want your opinion on that. So if it is like this, you, know, you already sold a product you know, for a lower price. You know, so you want to you know, raise the price. So you want to brand it as a separate product, you know, say something else, you know, like version two or something. You know, so, so what do you think about that? You know, and then raise the price for that. Or, you know, totally different brand name. You know, the brand name to the same customer? Yeah, to the same customer. If you want to raise the price. You know? How badly do they need your product? That's what it is going to depend on. Can they replace you or not? If the replacement cost of getting rid of you is much higher. Maybe they will stay. But here you're going to have an ego problem. Because your champion is going to feel like, hey, I got you in. Now you're raising the price on me. So you have to deal with that emotional aspect better. Well, I think the key is to find more customers. The idea if you give something cheap, you don't want to keep living off the same customers. No, but sometimes you can create more use cases, right? So for example, you sold, let's say you sold something where for X number of users, you gave some price, but now they want to have Y number of users. Now you can, you know, do better. Yeah. So I have a go-to-market question. Uh, I'm working on a sales AI sales assistant, and some of the initial from the initial meetings and things you know that, that I've observed, uh, and this is very limited right now, is 
I feel that people, especially low-level sales representatives, are kind of kept, you know, a little concerned that, oh, wow, this is like so high-tech, this is going to replace us. Although that's not the motive. It, it does replace the first few steps that a sales guy really does. But so you're like Conversica? Yeah, similar to that, but in a very um, in-depth manner. Similar to Conversica. The, the idea here is that, the, so how do you, like how do you have a strategy to, 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 to get that adoption? Like do you go to managers or do you not bother? Sales, SDR is not going to buy your product. That's very clear, right? Yeah, it it has to come from the VP. Yeah, but the question is, you know, you have to always show the value right. before the VP will put his or her job on the line f sure. because all of the reports are complaining about it, right? right? So, and then it's a question of how do you sit with the users and train them to use the product better? What's the value you're saying? Hey, by the way, you were doing 50 calls before. Now you can do 75 calls without putting the same amount of time. Or you get more qualified leads without spending, casting a wider net. You, you just get more Conversica had a lot of problem initially. There were too many skeptics, mm -hmm. but now I believe they're on fire. They don't even want to talk to you now. If you just send out an email saying, I want to have a demo, and you'd say, I have 50 users, they don't want to talk to you. So I tried that. I wanted to test that product, and they, they didn't even bother. They just said, no, we don't want to talk to you, well, which but is. But they have a very cookie-cutter model as well. It does a, a certain amount of things. Um, I don't know a whole lot, but from what I've, the initial test that I've done, what we're doing is like maybe go more in depth where you have an assistant that will just automate the process of selling right from the get go. In other words, it understands your products, it understands what questions you have, and solve that problem. So it's not just getting the initial contact, but it's kind of like a, a more deeper level of automation. But you, but you made your life miserable in terms of adoption though, because you are customizing the product for everybody. No, no, we just have to. It's not. You got to get their vocabulary, right? Yeah, yeah. There is custom, you know. Yeah. But if you're selling something, if you're effective, you have to know that as well, right? Yeah, yeah, if but... If you're replacing something, if you're replacing the, the junior sales rep, you have to be a little competent. Okay. So that's what exactly you, you'd said, right? right? This is why I'm scared of you as a junior sales rep. Right. You just said when I'm replacing the junior sales rep. So, right, actually, wrong pitch. Right. right? Pitch shouldn't be that. So the way I position it is, uh, you know, in every organization, there's a bunch of warm leads and cold leads, which often get ignored. And that's what this product will do for you. But while your human reps are chasing the hot leads, it's going to go to the warm leads and the cold leads and find the golden nuggets. <coughs> yeah, I mean, you can... You it offline, but I, I just yeah, it I mean, you can create an SQL for them, maybe, yeah. possibly. Or you can sell it to the marketing department and say, I'll give you a better MQL. Maybe there is no SDR there. Yeah. But I don't know the VP of marketing may not have a budget for it. So that's what you have to find. <coughs> but every marketing guy is told by the sales guy, your leads are shitty. Yeah, exactly. So. Guy says you're not following up enough or you're not. Yeah, so why don't you sell it to marketing guy? Right. And say, look, I know you have this problem. I can give you leads which are better. Right, that's what I did recently. I met a SDR manager that was heading like about 70 SDRs, he said, I don't want to lose my talent pool that I've built over the years, and they're such great people, and this thing can replace at least some of them. And then I said, no, no, it's not going to, and then they go like, then why do I buy it? They don't replace it. <laughs> That's why you have to sell it to the marketing guy. Plus, sell it to the company that has just started. Why do you want to sell it to the very large company? Yet? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what this guy told me. He says that if you have, if you go to people that are like, they don't have SDR capacities, startups, no, no, I would look at companies that is at least looking for five SDRs. Okay. Right? Now I go tell them, instead of those five SDR, you could actually do with two. And here is my product that will give you the benefit of those three. Possibly. And for what kind of like, uh, product skews, like lesser in value, where there's more selling required? I don't know where your product sits in, so I can't say. Yeah. What else? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, there are certain startups, uh, like you have a gut feel towards it. Maybe they're not going to make a lot of money, but uh, you 
have an immense gut feel that first of all it is inevitable, it has to happen in a certain time, technology based or whatever. And uh, it change, changes the uh, social fabric drastically. Mm -hmm. It changes, it's a very uh, high social responsible thing. Uh, but then it doesn't make a lot of money. Should you still pursue it? Depends on what your goals are, right? If you want to do social good, yeah, you should pursue it. Yeah, but then you need money to implement. I mean, the point is, it is inevitable. If somebody, some, it just want to happen eventually. Well, I mean, Facebook didn't make money for the longest time. Uh, it's not really very socially responsible. No, no, it was a very socially responsible product. It just became irresponsible rates recently. <laughs> the whole point was it. I mean, let's be very clear. Every product that has a good, some guy is going to use the bad out of it. That's always going to happen. Do you think Facebook had any idea that this is how people will use their product? No way. They had no clue. They don't even know what to do now. Because it's too complex a problem, right? Some guy sitting in India sent some message on WhatsApp, which is already encrypted to some 10 other people. What the heck does Facebook do? Short of trying to read your messages and unencrypting it now, which is worse thing than what they're doing today. Right. But then you should go ahead with it, right? It all depends on your gut. It's personal. It's personal. I can't answer that for you. He's being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Prescription. I don't know. Depends. Freemium works, yeah. If Facebook was freemium, do you think people would have a Facebook? I don't think so. Today people say that I'll buy a sub subscription, but I don't, I don't think so. No, that also may not be true. Actually, that may not be true. Their ARPU from India is less than a dollar. So they can make up a dollar from few rich people paying them that's what WhatsApp used to be. WhatsApp used to be one buck a year before Facebook came in and said it's zero. So don't be surprised. It used to be one dollar. No, they can do it on the usage basis. If you send too many good morning messages, you pay a dollar. <laughs> Taxing. Yeah, I know. That was another WhatsApp yeah, hoax. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, I just wish they continue. Yeah. <laughs> we are all victims of that. Hopefully, none of you send it, right? <laughs> what else? Anything else? Going once, going twice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.